what is Independ. For those who didn't actually research the topic a little bit before coming, uh, first and foremost, and originally, it was just a dependency analyzer. So a uh, dependency analyzer is going to show you <coughs> I've got this code and it uses this code, or it's going to show this code is used by this code, that kind of thing. <coughs> and that can be really helpful to un for you to understand, especially in situations where um, your architecture depends on loose coupling between things, and so if you start seeing things getting coupled, you know, you can put the kibosh on it sooner rather than later. Um, but now it also does a lot of code quality type things. So it's kind of encroaching on the other tools like um, FXCOP, NCOVER, and those kinds of things. They're kind of all now uh, functionality that this can use or supersede, su supersedes. So uh, it does a lot more these days than it used to. Um, and we'll, we'll look at each of these, but um, let's see, Age of Pioneer. <coughs> Some of these uh, things we can look at like brittleness and useless parts of your code. Uh, that's a kind of a novel thing that nothing else kind of really does. Another thing that's kind of cool about it is it'll allow you to uh, keep a baseline so you can keep track of whether your code, whether your code base is improving in quality over time or whether it's getting worse in quality over time. So that's kind of a neat little feature. All right, so why is why is this important? Well, I mean, I have a gripe slide at the end here, but I'll just do a little bit of it now. Software is an investment for most companies, most people, an expensive investment at that. Um, and the thing about this kind of investment is <coughs> if you've got good architecture, it will be easier to add and it'll be easier to build and, and you'll probably get a lot of use out of your investment. However, if you let your code quality slide, then the opposite is going to become true. Uh, we'll talk about more about that, like I said, later. But um, this kind of tool can help us uh, with something called the broken window theory. Has anyone ever heard of this before? I would mentioned a lot. It's in uh, pragmatic program or other things. But for those who are uninitiated, um, <coughs> broken window theory is actually a social science study. And they find that uh, if a window in a broken building is left unrepaired, then all the rest of the windows will soon be broken. And the reason for that is <coughs> uh, it kind of a broken window is a signal to the people around that it doesn't matter. No one cares about this building, about those windows. And so because no one cares, it's really easy and fun to contribute to the mess. <laughs> and we do this in software all the time. You see it a lot. You're like, well, I know what I'm doing here is not right, but... I'm under a lot of pressure from my project manager to get this feature in. Two lines of code and I'll just be done and I can just forget about it, right? But what you're really doing is you're contributing to the ugliness of the code base and the more it gets ugly, the more people are willing to do ugly things with it. Does that make sense? Those of us who are ugly resent this. Oh, well, my apologies to the uh, differently looking. <laughs> Um, another thing about software is it's really kind of difficult to see these kinds of relationships without using a tool like this. Uh, you may think you have an understanding of what dependencies you have, but uh, you're probably maybe only going to look at the first level dependencies. You may not understand the string of dependencies that come along with having just this one dependency. It could be literally a giant graph of things that you're actually <coughs> dependent upon and just un unwittingly using. Um, and another thing I put in here, understanding all those dependencies can help you understand how difficult something in the change in code could be. So if I want to say, oh, well, who's calling this method? I really should add this parameter or I really should change how it works a little bit. Um, how difficult would it be to change this? Well, you could see for sure and say, oh, 12,000 calls to this thing. Let's add a <laughs> let's add another overload for it instead of messing with it, which you should be doing anyway, because we'll practice open closed, right? Okay. <laughs> all right. So um, that's pretty much all I'm going to say about it, and then we're going to do some demos, and then we're going to come back to the sides a little bit. But let's do our first demo. So in this demo, keep me on track here so I don't forget stuff. I'm going to create a new independent project. I'm going to look at the HTML report it generates for us. Then I'm going to look at the dashboard it generates for us. Okay, so let's jump to that. So I'm going to 
hopefully change what I'm showing without causing you to stop recording. Okay, good. All right. So, yes, here is the code base. You can see good. <coughs> and uh, this is a kind of a bigger project that we wrote a few years ago. Uh, I believe it's got, yeah, 53 projects inside of here. And uh, the quality is okay. So it'll be a pretty good one to look at because we'll see problems and things like that. So I, I picked this to look at. Um, so after you get this installed, which I'm going to t say something just briefly upon, um, the installer doesn't actually move your exe to someplace else. <coughs> the installer adds some dependencies, but you're still expected to run that same exe after you've installed it. So the idea is you'd unzip it someplace, not in program files, because it can't really function there. You unzip it someplace and then use it <coughs> there. The first time you open it, it'll do an install. Then when you open it from there on out, it's just going to open. Um, also, the <coughs> install doesn't install the Visual Studio plugins you'll see here. You have to install those with a different exe in the bundle. But uh, assuming you got everything installed correctly, you should have in your extensions this new end-depend. What we want to do is attach a new end-depend project to the current VS solution. It's good that they're all green. It's going to ignore any um, test assemblies, so that's why it's got this minus test because uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense to, to get these metrics for tests. We're going to look at tests, but not, not code quality <laughs> tests. All right, so we're going to say analyze these 33 assemblies and build a report. So hit that. <coughs> and over in the corner here, it's churning, and it's going to build and do some things over here. And we can just wait a minute, maybe go get a drink of water. Check your email. Okay, and when you're done, you get this little dialogue. So, um, what we want to do is we want to browse <coughs> the dashboard. And it should have also opened up for us the Schmel report which I don't see. Dashboard analysis. I did tell it to do that, didn't I? Well, <coughs> yeah. <laughs> so the, uh, the dashboard is, is uh, the web dashboard is essentially the same thing as this. You get very similar graphs and things. The cool thing about having it build an HTML dashboard, though, is that if you're using this as part of a continuous integration, you can have it export and maybe show that as part of your continuous integration dashboard monitor. <coughs> but let's look at what we got here. So uh, it's saying when it ran, and we have 11,000 lines of code. Um, well, before it was a lot more, so there must have been a lot in those merges. <laughs> Estimated dev effort says this is 404 days of dev effort. So that's kind of cool. Uh, we have a bunch of types, 716 types defined in this, in 98 different namespaces, and 33 different assemblies, almost 2,000 different methods, several hundred fields, several hundred source files. Uh, okay, so this technical debt is kind of interesting, and this is something that nothing else that I know of does. So <clears throat> it's basically saying we found a bunch of stuff over here in quality, which we'll look at in a second. And if you're, by our estimation, if you were to try and fix all the quality issues with this thing, then yeah, it's going to take about eight days for someone working full time each day uh, to get that. Um, and that's just to reach an A. The total debt down here is actually 28 days. So depending on how picky you want to be, you can see there's a lot of okay problems, but uh, some of these critical ones is probably what it's going to get you to the A rating. <coughs> and you can explore some of this. So let's actually do that. So over here, uh, let me first explain what a quality gate is. A quality gate is <coughs> if you violate enough rules in a small enough, tight enough space, e.g. if this class violates three or four rules, something like that, then 
it's not going to pass the quality gate, and it's not going. I mean, in theory, you could say I, I'm not going to accept this uh, merge request because of quality issues for this. <clears throat> uh, but it basically says there, there's some there's some real hot spots and in, in quality issues that you probably should reject the code. So that's what that is. <clears throat> Excuse me. These rules are very similar to FX Cop if you ever run those. Uh, so, for example, if I click over here on the critical rule list, more on this later, but it's going to say uh, avoid methods that are too big, too complex. So, if we double click on it, it's, there's 11 of them, and we should be able to view the 11 if I can get past it here. There we go. So, I click on one of these, and it's saying this method here is. Oops, sorry. Come on, go away. Saying this method here is just too dang long. <coughs> and he's got a point. This method here is just too dang long. It's probably doing too darn much. So it probably should be fixed. Um, here's another one. So here's. Actually, this one didn't look half bad, per se. But still, you know. A couple pages of, of excuse me, a couple screens of code, right? Um, and you can see how bad it is. So this this validate argument is 81 lines of code. This one's 68. Uh, let's find a real good good one. Update 51. Uh, I mean, these are horrible, but yeah, these these probably could or maybe should be refactored. Um, let's go back to our dashboard. Did you set the thresholds to trip those, or does it? It comes with defaults, but the cool thing about it is all of this is configurable, as we'll see. Okay, so let's look at our quality gate issue problems. <coughs> and it's saying, uh, here are types too big. So this is one of the ones that's ca causing the trouble. So, um, extensions. So this class is 10,000 lines of code. So it says, nope, that's too big. Well, what does it consider too big? If you look up here, we can see when number of lines of code greater than 200. That's what it considers too big. In my opinion, that's a little conservative, but it's not a bad thing to have on your radar. If you have a class that's more than 200 lines of codes, you should probably understand why. Um, and then here we go, here's another one. This method is 398. So it's pretty big. So let's go back to the dashboard and let's see. So here we go, we've got, here's, here's our list of high, quali or high priority issues. So we're looking through here, we can see this has four issues on it, so this is a pretty big one. And we can even see what the issues are but yeah, it allows us to kind of drill down. But what's also cool is we haven't even looked at, <coughs> okay, go away. Um, here's some of the baseline data. Now, we only have one thing, so we don't have anything to compare it to. But if I had done this seven days ago and I clicked the seven days thing, it's going to give me all these diffs here where it says no diff. It's going to give me a green plus or a green or a red minus on, on these things, depending on whether Plus is good, I guess. <laughs> but it's going to tell me how this has changed over time. And that can be interesting to know. Uh, so, for example, if the number of lines of code dramatically increased over seven days, you might want to understand why that is. Uh, if, you know, the number, the amount of technical debt tripled, all right, who committed and <laughs> what did they commit? You know, that kind of thing. So it can help you keep an eye on things. And it will also help you with some of these graphs. So right now this is a very uninteresting graph as a, we have one data point. But over time, it can show us the number of lines of code as it's increasing, um, number of lines of code covered. That What that means is those lines of code covered talks about in the unit test. So if you run a unit test against this code, that's the number of lines that are actually exercised by the unit test. And that's really helpful. Some people push for 100% quote unquote code coverage, which probably isn't practical, but what is practical is making sure that you exercise all the main code paths. So if you have uh, an if statement in a piece of, in a method, make sure you put in a test that 
exercises going into the if statement and make sure you put in a test that exercises not going into the if statement, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's actually tools to help you there too, which I presented on in the past. Uh, and then another, this one is code coverage versus uh, technical debt over time, which is kind of cool. A number of issues over time, so you can see whether the number of issues is creeping up or creeping down. Now, where this is really would be good is if you used it right at the beginning of a project. If you're if you're getting into this point, I can see most managers wouldn't want to invest eight days to bring this up to an A level. But if you if you tell the person before you commit this, run it and get it to an A level before you commit it. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And timely is really a big deal. So um, as, as we'll talk about later, maybe, but <clears throat> it's good architecture, good code quality is going to make such a big difference on the journey you have just to completion, let alone the maintenance and things afterward. Um, just for an instance, Phil and I are working on a project currently where we inherited the code base and it wasn't necessarily very good quality. And we put, we had devs working on it for hundreds of hours trying to fix bugs, but it, they'd fix a bug over here, but pop up a bug over here, and then they're trying to fix this bug and then break everything else over here. It was very, very fragile code. I've come to learn over my experience, you can get fragile code to enough quality to deploy, but it's so much effort, you might as well have rewritten it. Um, so it's having the code of high quality during the journey, not just for when you've delivered it at the end, uh, it can make a big difference, <coughs> especially in bigger projects. So, um, yeah, thanks for that. We'll, we'll talk more. <coughs> um, yeah, there's quality gates, and then here's your debt. So, yeah, here's the dashboard. Um, any questions about anything you're seeing here? Method complexity, let's talk about this real quick. Um, does anyone know what cyclomatic complexity is? Okay, so... Um, that where you're having somebody read your mind and it's hard to read your mind? No, basically it's a way of estimating um, how difficult a method is going to be for somebody to follow and maintain because there's so many... You're reading your mind, I was right yeah. the first time. It's so quantitative than that. You can look at the number of branches in there and the, the number of code paths and give it a read right. from that. So I something something at, at like uh, 43 is extremely high. This is 46. This is extremely high cyclomatic complexity. And what that means is if, 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 if 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 and then case if 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 right and basically an if statement counts as one so two if statements in a method is going to be a cyclomatic complexity of two a switch statement it adds up quick because you get one two three four five there's no default it's going to be six what's that and when they nest it's when it's when you nest it, it adds it. So, <clears throat> um, this is that high simply because there's just that many different paths you can take through this thing, and it figures that because of that, it's really tough for a developer to really understand what's happening in this method. And they're probably right. It's not always that way. For example, this could be worse. You can kind of tell what it's trying to do. It's just trying to do a lot of things. It probably should be refactored. It probably should be broken up into better, smaller, discrete steps. But this isn't the worst I've ever seen. Um, let's go look at this one. It's probably going to be very similar. This is just a giant case statement. Those add up quick, right? Let's allow this to go down a little bit. Maybe find something that's like practically difficult. Hold is a good, probably a good example. Here we have a for each inside of for each inside of for each inside of for each. <laughs> And then that's inside of an if, and then there's another if with a for each with an if, and then an if for each, for each, for each, for each. So these these add up quick in terms of complexity. And this is complex. I mean, having this many for each inside of a thing, that's, that's going to be hard to understand, keep track of in your head what's going on here. Um, also, it could be a performance problem, so that's a good one too. 
Um, so that's com cyclomatic complexity in kind of a nutshell, but it, it tracks that as well. Um, if I wanted coverage data, e.g. Uh, code coverage, this doesn't actually provide it itself. Uh, that's built into uh, Visual Studio now. You just tell it you want a code coverage report, and then it just imports it and makes use of that data, so it doesn't have to really rebuild any of that, but also work with the third-party ones too. So if you have NCover or one of those other third-party code coverage utilities that generates those reports, it'll make use of that data. I haven't imported any data, so I'm not seeing any coverage data, but <clears throat> that's what that is. All right, I think I talked about just about everything. Let's look at this by different ways. Um, is there any questions? Move on, let's see. I told you I was gonna tell you about HTML report, which we didn't see, but it's the same as the dashboard, having issues, baseline, code rules. Okay, I did kind of mention it very briefly, but you'll see that anytime I've got something up here, it's giving me this, this query. Um, the cool thing about these rules is they're written in kind of a link syntax, for those who understand link. Um, <clears throat> all the rules that it has are just a query. Um, and so this link query is looking for cyclomatic complexity and does not abstract. And it's going to order it by cyclomatic complexity descending, and then it's going to select this object for me to, to view in this panel below. This whole, the whole uh, of this uh, tool is built off of these queries. They've actually taken your code, create, turned it into models, so you can actually look through them as though it was data, which is kind of cool. Um, if you had some reason to, I'm not sure why you would, but uh, you can actually use the API to get this data in your own uh, project. So I could actually run this query in my project about another piece of code, and it could give me that information. So that's kind of cool, too. <coughs> okay, so let's see. Let's do our second demo now. Um, so what I want to do now is I want to show you some other cool features. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Tools, no, Extensions, and Depend. Then I want Search by Criteria. So this is kind of cool. So it let's say I, I'm searching for flight and then data. Status. OK, there we go. Um, I can search in my code for different things. And um, again, you'll see it's actually building a link query. This is my search. And as I'm searching, it's building this query. But there's really cool things we can do here. So uh, if I go back, no, 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 come on. How do I get out of the editor part of it? Just do another one. Yeah, all right. So if I wanted to make a new rule, um, what I can do is say from m in methods, where m dot, just look at our cyclomatic complexity, let's pick on that guy for a minute. Uh, in, in Nate's book, anything more than 10 should probably be looked at. So if cyclomatic complexity is greater than 10, let me say greater or equal to 10. Then I want to select M. So here we see I just created a real quick query to show me everything with cyclomatic complexity greater than 10. Um, and I could do that with a couple things. So I can say that M dot, oops, and M dot, you know, is public. So I can just find the public ones. Anything I want, I can kind of do here. Now the cool thing is if I want to turn this into a rule, all I have to do is add, um, I forgot already, ah, oh, there it is, warn, <laughs> warn if, spell warn correctly, warn if count greater than zero. And then I can give it a name like too complex. Count 
There we go. And then, just like that, I could create my own rule that I want to have followed. Um, all of them are changeable, too. If you, you look into... What's that? Do you have to save it, or does it just save it automatically? I'll need to save it, but I'm not going to. <laughs> right. I just yeah. Just yeah. Um, and then, if we wanted to see, like, avoid types that are too big, you can see how they're created. Just double click them, and this is gives you all even the comments about how they've constructed it. Sorry, let me make this bigger. So here's the avoid types are too big. So it's number of lines of code are greater than 200, and then we want just my code, so we want to ignore generated code if they have like a designer file or something. And then we want to pull out this data about it, so I can see it in my report down here. So you can see I've got uh, the methods here, and then number of just my code, and then total number of instructions, and number of methods, 51 methods, number of fields, technical debt for this one. Cool, right? Annual interest. Not sure what annual interest is. Let's see. Hmm. Anyway, and there's also pretty good documentation behind all this as well, <coughs> right here. But let's do something kind of complex. So let's try it again. Let's go to search criteria. And instead of just doing the query, I'm going to try and avoid the query. So just using the options, I should be able to get something kind of cool. So I should be able to do. <sighs> I'm forgetting. So I want to search for methods by coverage of changes. So I want to look for added or factored and partially covered. And check this out. It generated a cool query for me. What this one will do is this will allow me to see <coughs> any m new methods that were either added or refactored and who only have partial code coverage on and it's going to give me that list in descending order of how much code that was changed. So if I were interested in a, a check-in and maybe it was a kind of a bigger one I could run that that query and I could see oh wow that method changed a lot and it no longer has enough code coverage to call this uh, good so I'm going to reject it until you know they add some coverage lines here so some unit tests <coughs> that makes more sense than coverage lines boy you really have your job editing when you do my videos don't you <laughs> if I get around to it at all it's not a big deal I just don't have time much at all but yeah so then we can uh, open up the query and see what it generated for us and this is it so yeah even queries of you know how it changed over time is something we can link for so that's pretty neat Okay, so let me show you one more cool one. Uh, over here, I'm going to find this hold. And of course, Visual Studio gives us this handy for reference thing, right? And that's kind of neat, right? But what if we want to know, like, not only who's calling it, but who's calling it through one of those other methods, like directly and indirectly, right? Mm -hmm. So I can do that. So uh, there's another tool where I right click on the, the thing, and then I find end depend here. And then I can say search f anything that uses this uses me directly or indirectly. Well, I should have picked something better than that. <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah. Let me see. Is there, is there something better? Maybe this one. I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't have the inkling that this one's going to show me any more than this. But that I use. Or use me. Let's try this way. Yeah, that's a little better. Oh no, this is everything I'm using directly. So that's not bad. It's kind of a bigger one, but yeah. Anyway, um, at, at this point, I'll point out when I said I Visual Studio does almost everything I want it to do. The first thing that comes to mind when I say almost is uh, if Nate, if you'll scroll to the, <coughs> to the top of the method, that that thing he's hovering over right now shows you the references, that's built into Visual Studio Pro and hired. I 
think, but it's not in community. And that's something I dearly love. And that's the one thing I think of, oh, I wish community had this. So it looks to me like if I only had community, I don't remember if community now lets you plug in new extensions, but I think it has to, right? Because everything works that way. Seems so. So I think you could get independent and get that functionality, it looks like. Yeah, in it's kind of cool. So that's cool. This is, this is not. Uh, I don't know what it costs. He'll probably cover that, I imagine. Actually didn't. Never looked. I got it for you for free because we're buds. <laughs> I'll look it up real quick. All right. Um, let's see. Any questions about what I'm showing so far? As, as you can see in, the, in that menu, it's it's pretty pretty helpful. Um, oh, I never did review the matrix. Maybe let's go look at the view dependence matrix. So this is kind of cool. Um, yeah, go away. This is going to tell me uh, my dependencies and. Again, this is a really big project, so this is kind of a <coughs> interesting thing. But if I click on here, uh, it'll show me the dependency here. And I'm not seeing large numbers like I expect. I expect to see larger numbers here, but maybe... probably in the project I'm in. Let's see. Let's go to a different project. Let's go to this is, is there a web project? Oh, uh, you know what? I just realized why this wasn't working before. I opened the wrong solution. There's multiple solution files. Oh. Ugh. That'll do it. Give me the dunce cap, will you? But this solution file doesn't have the web, so that's the one I really wanted to show. This is close, though. Um, but yeah, I can go in into this one and I can say, <coughs> come on, Solution Explorer. Okay. So I have that pricing here. Okay, what is pricing? So it, it's a little obscure, but Oops. the numbers that I'm seeing are for me, a, a single developer at home, or maybe just for myself at work. Uh, Independent developer one seat is four seventy seven, and for build machines it's five. And then they have an independent Azure DevOps TFS extension for uh, two hundred. It looks like uh, that one. That's five user pack. So anyway, so I'm saying four seventy seven for that, or they I think they have a subscription for nineteen a month. So if you were to get Visual Studio Community for free, it would be zero and plus 19 a month for independent. If you just wanted that feature, uh, you'd have to go to VS Pro to get it. And that, I think I'm getting VS Pro for 42 a month. So this is cheaper and comes with all this other stuff. So if that were the only feature, and for me it actually is, I think, it would be cheaper to do independent by better than half. And how much does it cost to become best bug buds? Got to run into a conference, I suppose. Bucks, it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right, let's see. I got lost here. I don't know what the purchase outright price is for the Visual Pro right now. Oh, I will mention one th more thing about the license. <clears throat> you know how usually you buy a license for something and and you can install it on your work computer and your work laptop or your home computer and your work computer or whatever two or three installs you think you could get a license well this isn't that way <laughs> you get one license so I had to deactivate my desktop before I could <laughs> run it on my laptop oh. just FYI I thought seat would mean my seat not my computer's seat no that's like this computer has the active license yeah okay. I think that's kind of a bummer especially a bummer. considering if my hard drive failed I'm not sure how I would recover it <laughs> So, not perfect. <coughs> All right, let's see. Uh, I was going to show something. What was it, Phil? Got out of my groove here. You were going to show the web, I thought, last. Fancy matrix. Anyway, if I found something more interesting to do dependency matrix on, <laughs> it'd be helpful, but <laughs> most of these methods only have one dependency, so it's not that interesting to see. <coughs> Um, well, I can see where this would be extremely helpful. 
Let's see. I wonder if you'll give it to me for the whole pendency graph. The whole solution. She's doing it for the where I'm at. Okay, there we go. So this is the whole project. Um, and as you click on things or hover things, I'll show you. Uh, and then you can show a dependency graph for it. It looks less like a graph and more like a Hey, there's my web report I was looking for. <laughs> this is the web report it generates. Neat, huh? <laughs> it's pretty much the same thing we were looking at earlier, but it's just kind of a web version of it. Um, but yeah, um, dependency graph. So, um, and this is type. So this is going to tell me what type it is. And when I hover over here, you can see Air Service Central. <coughs> it's basically used by everything. That means anything I do here is going to impact a lot of things. In fact, did we see the brittle on this dashboard? I don't. I swear it's on the web dashboard though. Yeah, so if, if I look in here, it'll, it plots some of these things. So um, <clears throat> the further something is over here, uh, the useless, more useless it is. E.g. it doesn't really have anything that's actually doing anything. Um, it's just defining something perhaps or maybe not even that. The more it is over here, the more it's got direct references to it. So this is why it's called the zone of pain. If you were to try and change something in these, it would be tough to do. Uh, and stuff in the that's kind of in the good in the middle here has the right amount of implementation and abstractness and cohesion that it's it's fine. So yeah you can see a lot of the stuff is landing over here in the painy painful zone. Um, here's my map here. Let's view a scaled one. This is all of uh, my code base. The big blocks are lots of code. Like this is a really big method or uh, lots of code is I think we decided 200 or something like that. And then uh, the reason is that's why it's big. But the reason it is red is because it's cyclometric complexity. So anything that's this color is a 20 and it can go all the way up. So if it's a yellow, it's kind of a 10. If it's an orange, it's somewhere between 10 and 20. And you can kind of see where these things live. Um, so something like this finance is kind of a complex and this piece right here is pretty dang big, right? Um, the air finance is a part of the whole solution is, is not as as big as some other pieces like you know the inventory or the data pieces but um, it, this might be something to look at because it's a small piece and it's very complex okay so let's look at it what's next here close that um, oh yeah here's a full matrix let's look at this guy I said scale didn't I so this is going to give me how many dependencies I have on the other thing. So I have five dependencies on, um, let's see, how does this work? I have to remember, I have another two dependencies this way. Do you remember how this works, Phil? I'm sorry. Not familiar. Okay. Maybe you can tell me what that division down the middle is, because I see that it's perfectly symmetric. Uh, it's not perfectly symmetric. I mean, there's always, I mean, one to one or four to two. But if if there's well, the a, a box are, here, the there's a box here. Yes, that's right. Um, I'm trying to remember what that means, and I'm coming up blank. Let's see. Does it tell us? Come on. See, this is why I suck at this. I should not be a teacher. No, just <laughs> Here we go. There's the help. <clears throat> All right. Let's see. Let's 
number of types involved in the coupling. And it's saying use interactive to explore it. So, yeah, I think it's just number of types one way versus the other. I mean, this 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 isn't explorable because this is the web report, but it is explorable in the other one, and we should be able to see um, that this has five dependencies on. I'm guessing this, and it's got two dependencies backwards. So, I'm pretty sure that's kind of what it is. Got it. So it's saying that first row is dependent on 17 and 18. It has two variables on 17 and 18. Right. And that's why it's also in blue on the other right. side. Right. So the, the, the 10 here right. and the 10 here are the same. That's why there's a line here. You, it doesn't make sense to have dependence on yourself. But <clears throat> uh, 10 here and then 4 here means that you have a dependency of 4. So if you go to 4 and you look at 10, there it is. So, yeah, that's how it works. There we go. I got it. Got through it. <clears throat> and here's our full dependency graph with all of our types. So, ideally, it shouldn't look quite this uh, busy, but sometimes, sometimes it just does. All right. Let's see. Was there anything else? All the, we looked at all these on the other one, right? Percentage of coverage change. Little summaries. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I got it. I'm looking at. I was just looking up how to read that graph, that coupling graph. Uh huh. And on the page with it, there are so many different types of graph graphs that are supported for different metrics in this thing. It's <coughs> astonishing. They're really impressive. There's a lot of data. I mean, a lot of data in this thing. So, okay. Um, Why would instability be the opposite of abstractness? If it's very abstract, then nothing's ever going to have a concrete instance of it, right? So, and in fact, uh, if we look at this, it gives us a little bit of uh, why it's telling us. And you know, you take it with a grain of salt. This is something that's unique to this tool. This is a metric he invented. It can be useful, but as with any metric, you need to understand it. So, so let's see. It's considered stable if you've been under similes. It's considered stable means it's painful to modify. Okay. All right. Um, Let's move on. Okay, so uh, as Phil pointed out before, um, <clears throat> this is a, a great tool to have as part of a build process. These are the supported uh, continuous integration tools, um, which is most of the ones anyone would ever use anyway. So uh, supports those pretty well. All right, I told you it was coming, and, and so here it is. My musings on code quality. Um, oop. So we have had a lot of what we call rescue projects, where um, what generally happens is a pattern of they ask for a change, and then it, it takes a long time, longer than expected. They ask for another change, it takes even longer. They ask for another change, and then developers start saying, like, that's impossible. Then they ask for another change, and then it destabilizes the rest of the app, and it crashes everything. And every This is a, a very strong indication that you might have <coughs> code quality problems and architectural problems. And sometimes code quality problems and architectural problems are difficult to distinguish. Maybe they're the same thing. But um, the, problem, the thing that sucks is oftentimes these companies don't even understand that that's what's happening. Often developers don't even understand that's what's happening. Um, they just understand this is difficult to add to because it's complex. Or this is difficult to add to for this reason or this reason or that reason. Because they understand the reasons it's difficult to add things to, they don't maybe not under, they maybe don't see it as this is a problem. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we had some software that we took over. It was immensely complex. One guy on this planet and one guy only could ever 
effectively service it. And that's a problem. That's a big problem. That's a sucky problem uh, because that means that either somebody else needs to get to that level of internal knowledge, which could take years, or it needs to be rewritten because it's too, too dang complex. Um, another thing that we have happen is uh, we write a piece of code and then we pass it off to a, a client and they hire the cheapest developer they can find and <laughs> very quickly the code gets ruined, quite frankly, and that's a problem. <coughs> um, yeah, so I, I, like I said before, this code is very interesting. It's kind of like it's kind of like food in that if it gets spoiled, you kind of have to throw it out. It's not like you can just scrape some of the mold off the top sometimes. Sometimes you can, right? <laughs> but oftentimes once it gets to a certain state, it's just it's no longer worth keeping. Um, and it's really easy to slip in that state. You know, I, the laws of thermodynamics say things tend to slip towards entropy, right? So um, you have to be vigilant if you're going to keep code. So I guess my advice to anyone who's financing the writing of code is make sure that the code is high quality because if it's not, you've wasted your investment. It might work that one time you deploy it. It might even work five years later, but if it's not maintainable, you're not gonna be able to build new features upon it. You're not going to be able to update it with new frameworks as they come out. Those old frameworks get deprecated. You're just gonna be stuck. Um, it happens all the time. I see it all the time. I can put, put this down here at my bottom. Most code written is wasted. It's just, that's kind of my pet peeve, oops. Um, so, <clears throat> let's see. I think I covered all this, right? And, and a lot of this is uh, our fault, too. Like, um, developers rarely are, are helpful in fixing problem because they're like, the project manager's like, I, I want this new feature. Give me this new feature. Clients are looking at features. Everyone's looking at features, right? Because they want to make money off these features. But uh, code quality is going to have an effect over the, the whole investment, not just that feature. So it's, I mean, it, it gets, it's understandable why that gets pushed in there. Um, let's see, what else was I going to say? You have to go slow before you can go fast. Gosh darn. All right, I'll lock it. Um, as to your comment earlier, <coughs> yeah, you want to make sure as you're building this thing that you've got good footings. If you're finding that, hey, I'm already starting to hit some of these quality issues that I mentioned before, e.g. it's difficult to stabilize for deployment, it's difficult to add features to, it's difficult to change in meaningful ways. If I'm starting to experience those and I'm still developing it, do something the sooner you do, the, the, the better, right? Um, it feels like every time I come up to the crossroads of, should we fix or rewrite this or should we just kind of keep plowing through that same road? I almost always err when I when I go for keep plowing. I almost err because it always takes longer. That's it's frustrating to me because I feel like that contributes to the waste. But what's really the, the, I guess the truth is, is it was already wasted before I got there. I'm just trying to clean it up. So I don't know. Do you have anything to add to that, Phil, on my musings? Too too close to home. Don't don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> my foot in my mouth. Um, there's, I don't know if you pointed it out, but I, I especially want to point to the second one where developers really help, help in fixing the problem because everyone's focused on features. The, the, what that means is that the only time that quality can be implemented or, or it, it, you know, injected into the project is as you go. So you have to go slow before you go fast. I don't know if you actually spelled that out, but that means you need to put effort into quality up front for with design and architecture so that quality is there from the beginning. This tool can help you keep it as you go. It can identify it later, but then someone has to convince a client to spend money on quality that gives them nothing tangible to them. 
uh, and they don't understand. They, they can never understand, and we can't expect them to. That will never change. We have to add quality as we go, with every step, with every pull request, with every commit. It's just so easy <laughs> to make a mess, too. It just really is. Anyway. May I, may I say something that is very, very pertinent? Absolutely. You maximize your 401k, you can retire sooner. And then you don't have to worry about it. So you're saying we wouldn't have to be supporting it because you're retired? Mm -hmm. uh, Retirement is fun. Let me tell you. I'm young enough to be the ones that are being left behind when people retire and leave <laughs> me the mess. <laughs> you won't always be. Anyway. Beyond my musing of code quality, I don't have anything other than questions or comments. So. So I think you said, and I just wanted to double check, uh, the scripts that define these uh, metrics for the reports, every single one of them is available for you to view, edit, change? Yep. Cool. Yep, every one I click on, it actually shows me the code by default. So if I come to, you know, some of these medium, and you can see that's the this is the to define all the mediums. But if I want to look at like a specific issue, I can do that too. So let's see. I don't want to open a declaration. I want to go to how was I doing this before? I want to look by issues. 41 issues. So then I can look in issue. And here it is right here. This is how it's finding all these issues with that problem. Constructor should not call a virtual method. Oh, that's a good one. I could muse on why that's a good one, but anyway. <laughs> but yeah. As you look at the times, do you feel they're pretty honest? Uh, the times? The times. To oh, the, to, to fix it? Yeah, I think they're actually pretty good. I, I think he's done his homework, for sure. And does, it, does it only work C sharp, or does it work C++? Or, or like That's a good question. I don't know. I imagine it would probably work with any CLR language. So if it's C++ CLR, I think it might actually work still. Uh, VB, I bet it would work. Except everything would be red, because <laughs> I think th the most important thing though is this, this. I, I feel like that is pretty spot on the, the ratings that it gives you and then the this is the lowest hanging fruit button that I can push it says you want an A solve these man you know <laughs> how cool is that right <laughs> do you guys use this in production not yet I have the one license. <laughs> it would have to be the build server license. And I have on another top tangent, I suppose, which is fine, we're pretty much done. I have this notion that I don't want a bunch of dependencies um, in a build server that I can't automate, right? I don't want to have to, if I would have to replace my build server, I don't want to have to install Windows and then say, okay, now i got to install this, 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 this. Oh, I need to version this of this, and I need to version that of this. I want a Docker image of my build server, and I want to be able to kill it and update it with the newest version of that image and then rebase whatever I want on top of it and go. So I haven't figured out how exactly this kind of thing factors in. I'd have to get it installed on a build server via Docker, and I'd have to automate that process, which I'm getting a lot better at for Windows containers. But it's difficult. Um, his install probably is a lot better than some other tools. It's just an exe. If I run it once with a silent, it would probably just install. I could probably, as a Docker, we all know Docker, right? I mean, ish. I, I could probably base off of uh, Windows uh, Jenkins, and I could probably just say run this or add this file, which is the installer, then run that installer with the quiet command, and then commit that image as my new base and that would that would work just fine um, but I I am very sensitive to having what kind of like but a component one control like we've got another project that we used to have that had these component one licenses but there would be no way 
no way to get it in a do do into a Docker container. So I, I just I hate those. <laughs> It's not only impractical to put on a Docker container, it's impractical to put on a build server, but whatever. It's impractical to put on a developer machine. It's impractical. Well, even more impractical to put on a developer machine than a build server. Yes. <laughs> so, I'm not a fan of component one. <laughs> I used to be a different no more. Yeah. So you guys don't currently use a tool that's equivalent to this thing? There, like I said, there's actually tools that, for example, FX Cop. Uh, that sort of thing, really easy to put in those build tools because it's pretty much already there and it's free and you just have to say enable and it goes. And that gives you a lot of this stuff. All, all of these right here, um, he's made up his own on top above and beyond what FX Cop has, but all these right here you get from FX Cop. Coverage you get from if you have Visual Studio coverage and, and things done. Um, method complexity you could also get from a higher SKU Visual Studio, I think, Enterprise. Um, you'll never see any place that tells how many comments, but I don't know how useful that is anyway. Um, the number of types, that's pretty unique to his. Number of lines of code, you can get other ways, but it's not that useful a metric. Probably wouldn't be worth doing. Um, the technical debt is exclusively his thing, and I love it. So, the trend line of code quality over time, that would be hard to replicate, but possible perhaps so yeah you can get a lot of this if you t tinker with your build tool long enough but it might be worth the 499 477 yeah tool. it's a cool tool I like it and it's come a long way and it's got some power behind it this is really neat like I can't tell you how geeky I am about introspecting your own code with Link. I mean, <laughs> neat feature. Other questions? All right, well, we can be done.